Well, we're going to be talking today about, uh, I think, a uh, relevant topic, an important topic. And uh, I've entitled this message, Handling Life's Impossible Situations. Handling Life's Impossible Situations. And this evening, I have only one pur purpose, and that is to encourage you. Only one purpose, and that is to encourage you. And when we talk about impossible situations, um, you know, what, what are we really talking about? I'll give a definition in a minute, but, but, but when we think about impossible situations, we, you know, these are the unexpected things that happen. The unexpected things. Life is full of these. When we were coming back from the wedding hall this afternoon on the road here, did anybody else see a car accident? In the car, you know, and, and then the car, it wasn't two, we didn't see two cars hit. It was one car and it was on its side. It was on its side. And then as Ellen and I were coming here this tonight, she was still thinking about it. And she said, well, how did that car get on its side? Well, you see, the person that was driving that car, they didn't ever anticipate that happening. And they never anticipated that happening. Things happen that we don't anticipate. And so impossible situations, we all face them in our lives. And the, the, the goal for us as Christian is how do we handle them? How do we handle when we, uh, when we find ourselves in impossible situations? How do we respond? How do we maintain a biblical perspective when our emotions are pulling us in a different direction? Now, what is an impossible situation? And we have a definition on the screen. An impossible situation, this is my definition. An impossible situation is a circumstance that occurs in your life that is emotionally overwhelming, brings on feelings of hopelessness, challenges your faith in God's sufficiency, and makes you want to act in the flesh because trusting God for his provision just seems just too hard. Yahambando, chega, reading, I guess, middle. An impossible situation is a circumstance that occurs in your life that is emotionally overwhelming, brings on feelings of hopelessness, challenges your faith in God's sufficiency, and makes you want to act in the flesh because trusting God for his provision seems just, just too hard. So how should we respond when we find ourselves in the midst of an impossible situation? Well, tonight I want to look at three examples in the Bible. Three examples in the Bible where people found themselves in impossible situations. And we can learn from them about how they, they handle those, uh, those situations. And I want to give you three, actually three main points. Four situations, three main points. And our first main point is on the screen is don't give up hope when all seems lost. Don't give up hope when all seems lost. And uh, in, in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and this will be on your screen, I'm going to read this. And this is describing a situation between the prophet Elisha and, and those that were his disciples or those that he, were, he was teaching. And, uh, I'm reading, I'll read, you follow along as I read. Now the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Please let us go to the Jordan, the Jordan River, and each of us take from there a beam, and let us make a place there for, for ourselves where we may live. So he said, Go. So in other words, they're saying, Can we go down to the Jordan River, cut some trees, take the wood, and, and build a place for ourselves? Verse 3. Uh, then, one, then one said, please be willing to go with us, be, be, going, be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. So please, teacher, master, please go with us. And he said, okay, I'll go. Verse 4, and he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a, felling a beam tree, cutting the tree, the axe head fell into the water. 
And he cried out and he said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. He means the axe was borrowed. So he's chopping, chopping, chopping. And then the, the metal, the, the iron axe head fell into the water. Now in verse 6, Then the man of God said, talking of meaning, meaning Elisha, Where did it fall? He said to his, his follower there, Where did it fall? Show me where it fell. And, he, and when he showed him, showed him the place, he cut off a stick, he threw it in there, and made the iron float. Now I know we have a bunch of scientists in here, but let me ask you a question. Do, does iron float? Okay. There's no water in my glass. Hint, hint. But if there was water in my glass, and I put iron, would it float or would it sink? Hello? Okay, thank you. We, only, we have one scientist here tonight. Okay. <laughs> iron doesn't float. But Elisha did a miracle. Okay, Elisha did a miracle. But you see, that young man, of course, at that time, this is before modern times, they, they don't have they, no factories to manufacture things. Especially metal was very valuable. And so he borrowed an axe. The little young guy doesn't have any money. He borrowed an axe. We're going to do this job. Oh, my goodness. It, something, you know, the axe head went in the water. It's impossible. What are we going to do? It's in the river. How deep's the river? Who knows? I don't know. But you see, the, he, but he went to his master. He could have said, if it, you and I, we're probably, okay, just, you know, kind of throw it away and kind of try to get out of it. But you see, he went and told his master, don't give up hope when all seems lost. And Elisha, he told Elisha, Elisha did a miracle. And the, the young man, he had the faith enough to at least tell his master, Elisha, about the situation. We don't know exactly, did he say, please help me get it out? Or, but nonetheless, that's what happened. I was in a conference several years ago in the Philippines, and we were, uh, we were having a prayer time. And we were praying about this group of people that were rather isolated. They had no contact with the gospel. And as we prayed, we, we shared different prayer requests. One of those prayer requests was for this people group. And we, we went around and we prayed. And it's like, okay, we did that. And then somebody else who lived, uh, this was in the Philippines, but he, he lived in Seoul. And he lived on Yoido. You know, Yoido. Yoido for Indian brothers and sisters is the kind of the Manhattan Island of Korea. It's a government financial center there in, in Seoul, and it's very crowded, especially the, the apartment complexes. There's not enough parking. And this, the, this, uh, this man gave the prayer request, and he talks about how the Kyungbi Ajishi, the, the watchman, always fussed at him about his car because he never parked his car in the right place. But there's, there's not enough space. There's not enough space. I would hate to live there. And, and, you know, especially at nighttime, everybody comes home from work and it's just crazy. You know, Korea, you see the cars, they, they, not in the parking spaces, but they put them in the middle. And they're in neutral. So when you need to get your, you push, everybody's pushing cars, you know. All of a sudden you feel like Superman or something, you know. You, I can push a car. And you got women push cars. You got little kids pushing cars. Well... You know, something struck me as he said, I'm, you know, will you pray for me? Will you pray that I can have a parking place? Well, do you know it was easier for me to pray for this unreached people group, this group of people in some foreign country, God reached them with the gospel, than it was to pray, God, let him have a parking space at his apartment complex on Yoido. I've been there. I've seen it. In my eyes... It's impossible. But you see, how many of us uh, are, are like that? We, we see things through human eyes and it up, give up hope. It's impossible. You know, how many times do we see an impossible situation and give up and we never ask God for his help? The right thing to do 
is to pray for the unreached people group. The right thing to do is to pray for a parking place. But you see, we see something, and in our eyes it's impossible. And how often do we not, oh, we don't even bother to pray because it's like hopeless. That young man with the axe head, they learned a very, all those young boys, those young men, they learned a valuable lesson. Don't give up hope when all seems lost. The second point I want to make tonight is that uh, remember that little is much if God is in it. Remember that little is much if is God is in it. Repeat that after me. Remember that little is much if God is in it. And this is, there's a message from, uh, there, there's a scene from Judges, Judges chapter 15 and verse 15. And it, it, this is, uh, comes from the life of, of Samson. Samson, uh, you remember Samson. Was he weak or strong? Okay, strong. He was also at a time, he was, uh, Samson had a special gift of, from God. And he was a Nazarite and he had a special gift from God of strength. And he had some other rules that, about his lifestyle that he was supposed to keep. Samson at that time was, uh, he was a judge of, of Israel, but before he was a judge, he was just a strong guy. And a bit of a, we, we, we say kegel jangy more than that. <laughs> he was a troublemaker. He was actually a troublemaker. He, uh, Samson, if, if you look in chapter 14, it talks about how Samson, uh, he was supposed to marry a, a girl from, we, we had a wedding today, and we, he was supposed to marry a girl from his tribe, but he wanted to marry a girl from another tribe. And the Bible says that this girl looked, it says, looked good to him. Okay, you wonder, look good to him. Uh, so he, he, you know, here's Miss whatever, Miss Philistine. <laughs> and he wanted to marry her, not Miss Korea, but Miss, Miss, Miss Philistine. So, I'm going to marry her. Well, okay, the parents, him and Haw, okay, we're going to do it. On the way going to the village to make arrangements, he was attacked by a lion. And, and it says that he, he killed the lion very easily. He went to the village, his girlfriend's village, made the arrangements. Coming back, he saw that in the, in the dead carcass of a lion, that the bees, honeybees had come and they had made a nest and there was honey there with honeycomb. And so he took some of it out, tasted it, went on his way, gave some to his parents, never told them where it was from. Next time he goes to the village, he's making the feast before his wedding. He's making his wedding feast, seven day feast. And so his family and then the family of his, his wife, of his bride, and also the village. Seven-day feast. And he gives them a riddle. Uh, and he gives them a riddle to solve. And he's being kind of prideful. And he, and he says, well, I have a riddle. If you solve it, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a big reward. But if you don't solve it, then I want you to give me a big reward. And uh, he gave them the riddle, and he says, I'm going to give you a riddle. If you can solve it within 30, you know, within seven days, then, then uh, you know, we'll see who wins this kind of a, it's kind of like a bet. So the people of that tribe said, okay, we'll take you up on it. And he gave, a, he gave a, uh, this riddle, and the riddle was this. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something to eat. Well, honey, honeycomb inside the dead carcass of a lion. Well, after three days, his new bride, her, her friend's family, village, tribe and all, they can't figure it out. Okay? The deadline was seven days. Well, three days in, they can't figure it out. And so they go to her and say, we are going to burn you and burn your family's house and do everything unless you tell us what the, unless you find out what the, what the answer is. Well, be, be careful, men, because the wife, she, she used her womanly skills. 
she began to, she began to cry. And she began to nag. Oh, you only hate me. Oh, not a little shit on my hell. You don't love me, you know. That's, women have skill in that. So you, I, see, I can't act. So that's because it's not natural to me. Well, every day, okay, every day, she's nagging her husband. She's crying. She's weeping. Of course, she's afraid for her life and the life of her family. And it got so bad on the last day, he finally told his wife. And what did she do? She told her village. And so the village, uh, then it comes the seventh day, and the, pe the men of the city came to him and said, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And he knew, Samson knew immediately that his wife had betrayed him. And he said, if you had not plowed with my heifer, <laughs> you would not have found out my riddle. And he went down and he took revenge on 30 other Philistines and brought back, the, brought back what he was supposed to give them. And, uh, and then he did that. Well, after that, he, did not, he went back to his village without his wife. He was so angry with her. But then later... He goes back down to her village and says, this is my wife. We got married. Okay. I said, I do. I do. Okay. We're married. I'm really mad at her, but I'm going to go back to her. Or knock on the door. And the father won't let him in. I thought you were so mad. I gave her in marriage to your friend. And he said, oh, it doesn't her. Yo dong sing. Do do ye pujo. Isn't she more pretty than her sister? Well, Samson, he said, now when I take revenge on you, it's justified. And Samson, he was, did something really, I'd like to see it happen. He took, he took uh, what does it say, 100, 100 foxes? He took foxes, two foxes, tied, he took 100 foxes, tied their tails together, put a torch in the middle. At that time, it's harvest time. All the grain, everything's ready to be harvested. Set the torch on fire and, and let it go. And it let it go. And, and, let, and how much damage did it do? It said that it burned down, um, okay, excuse me, 300 foxes. 300 foxes. And it said that it burned down... Uh, the, the shocks, the standing grain, vineyards, and the groves. Everything. Well, the Philistines weren't happy. They came up with their army and came up to the Israelites. And they said, give us Samson. And Samson at that time, he had, after all this, he went to, the, he went to, a, he went to a desolate place. Give us Samson, or you're, we're going to wipe you out. At that time, the Philistines were, were ruled, uh, ruled the Jews. Well, the Jews took 3,000 men and went out to Samson and said, Look, we're going to turn you over to them. And they bound him, and, they, and Samson said, Okay, I'll let you take me, just don't kill me. And they said, We won't kill you, we're just going to... Bind you and we're going to take you over. Well, they took him over to the Philistines and they thought, wow, we've got Samson now. We've got our enemy. Well, okay, Incredible Hulk. Okay, he broke, he broke the things. He was surrounded. Has nothing in his hand. And then in, in verse 15 of Judges 15, so... Here is, here is Samson in an impossible situation. He's surrounded by all these men, and, but listen what happens. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he reached out and, look, and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Okay? Now, can, does one man possess the physical energy enough to kill a thousand men? Yes or no? Come on. Okay, thank you very much. 
In wartime, if, if, if one man kills a dozen people with a you know, machine gun or something, well, wow, he's courageous. He's a hero. He did well. But how many men can one man kill with a sword? Not a thousand. But here, how can one man survive against a thousand when he has nothing to fight with? So, Samson was in an impossible situation. Surrounded, a thousand to one, more than a thousand to one, but he found that jawbone. And he prevailed because of the point that we just made. Little is much if God is in it. Little is much is if God is in it. God used that jawbone in Samson's hand to bring, around a, bring about a great victory for Israel. That's what the scripture says. Remember that the Holy Spirit had not only empowered Samson to do this feat, but it, it, he also provided him with what? The tool to do it. He gave him the, the tool to use. If you're in an impossible situation, what resources are already there that God has placed there for you to use? God wants, to, wants you to be successful. God leads and directs our lives. Do you believe that? Yes? Okay, got to talk to me now. And in the midst of that situation, he will provide you the tools and the resources you need for you to be successful. Years and years ago, I was, uh, when I was in uh, at college and uh, graduate school, I used to go to uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I used to go to the uh, prison. Uh, well, there was a prison system there, and I used to do jail and prison ministries. And every week, I would go to, I would go to uh, the, the prison there. There's, these men were, you know, here's the bars, and you just go there, and you're, you're face-to-face. These guys were locked down 23 hours a day. This is after they have been convicted of their crime, but before they get their sentence. It was called the R&E Center. And I did that for, for five years. These guys, m- most of them were younger, most of, them, uh, most of them were black. Most of them had been arrested for drugs, some for murder, some for rape. These are bad guys. These guys have had a life that is completely different from, from me. The one thing that struck me about these guys is literally when it comes to drugs, okay, I've got it, sell it, we know we pass it like this. These guys are, these guys are, so many of them had said, oh, I just wanted to, you know, I was going to sell drugs just for a couple years, make some money, and get out of it. You know, get out of it. You know, and these guys have literally had millions of dollars pass through their hands. Literally have had millions of dollars pass through their hands. So many of them said, it's a good thing that I'm in, I'm in prison. Because either I was going to kill somebody or I was going to be killed. You can't, you don't sell drugs without a gun. Because there's always, you know, everybody, everybody wants to take your place. And so many, so many of them said that. Well, I have news for you. I do not come from that kind of background. So how does Robert come and to relate to these, uh, relate to these guys? Well, every week I just pray, Lord, give me insight. Give me a word of wisdom. Help me to understand what I need to do to help relate to these guys so they can hear your message. And, you know, actually, the, the, man, the ministry went very well. I, I, uh, it was difficult, but it's, I learned so much and actually have a heart for those guys. <clears throat> but I was successful. I learned how to be successful. What were the keys? Listening. Listening. Okay, my grandmother used to say, you have two ears and one mouth. Okay, you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. Amen. Okay, uh, Bible says, it says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I'm not looking at you for any particular reason. Okay, God is working on, I'm impatient too. Don't worry about it. We're all impatient. Okay, bali bali, right? <laughs> So listening, showing interest, 
in speaking the truth in love. Okay, this is God's, God's word, God's truth. Speak the truth in love. For some of us, maybe our impossible situation might be ministry related. What does Robert Hale grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee in the suburbs, uh, probably, uh, probably had about only two or three black friends and then I'm in a situation living Columbia, that area of Columbia, 70% black. The prison was overwhelmingly black. You know, what do I have in relation to, to that? Well, guess what? God gave me the tools. God gave me the insight to be able to relate. And we had a great relationship. You may see yourself in, you know, the language barrier. The language is so, I feel so embarrassed when I speak Korean. I, every time I speak Korean, I see you guys kind of smile at me and laugh a little bit. Well, what can I do? God's called me here. I'll do the best I can. When you go to America, don't, you know, don't worry about it. God will help you. God will help you. You may see yourself as inadequate for the task, but remember that God has allowed you to encounter that opportunity. And what? He will give you the tools and the resources that you need to be successful in order for his glory, okay? His glory, if he is leading you, he will bless your efforts. So handling life's impossibles, impossible situations. First, don't give up hope when all seems lost. Second, remember that little is much if God is in it. And third, is a, is, a, is a very important point. Remind yourself, remind yourself that nothing is impossible with God. Remind yourself, remind yourself that nothing is impossible with God. In uh, Genesis 18, 14, uh, in the uh, angel of the Lord came and Abraham and, and Sarah met the angel of the Lord. And uh, Abraham invited him into the house. Abraham at that time was, do you remember how old he was? They had no children. Okay, Abraham's 99 and, uh, and Sarah is 89. And the angel of the Lord said, said to them, I'm going to come back here one year from now and you're going to have a son. Well, it says when Sarah heard that, she's getting ready to serve, and she heard that and kind of laughed a little bit. You know, we wanted, we wanted kids for, you know, for so long. We never had kids. Now I'm homony, and we're going to have kids. And she laughed at first, but if you look in Hebrews 11.11, 11, it says that she received the word by faith. She laughed at first, but guess what? She believed it. She received the word by faith. And the, the message from the angel was, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Fast forward to the New Testament. Once again, an angel appeared. The angel Gabriel appeared to a teenager by the name of Mary. And he gives her a message and he says that you're going to have a child. And she says, well, how is that possible since I'm a virgin? And the angel said to her in, uh, in verse 37, he said very simply, for nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. And in the next verse 38, it says this, and Mary said, Behold, the bond, the bond slave of the Lord, your, I'm your servant. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In other words, she believed it. She accepted it by faith. The angel spoke to a grandmother. That was a grandmother in the sense of no children, but an old lady. And said to her, you know, you're going to have a son. And he said, is anything too difficult for the Lord? She believed him and she had a son. Mary, angel Gabriel said to her, you're going to be blessed among women. 
Because you're going to give birth to the Son of God. You're going to give birth to the Savior of the world. Well, how is that possible? I've not had relations with anything, with anyone. And, uh, and the angel says, For nothing will be impossible with God. And she received it by faith and said, May it be done to me according to your word. By faith. She received it. Remind yourself that nothing is impossible with God. You believe that? Amen. I hope so. Without faith, without faith, folks, this there is no uh, there is no power. There's no reality without faith. Handling impossible life's impossible situations. Don't give up hope when all seems lost. Remember that little is much if God is in it. And remind yourself that nothing is impossible with God. Charles Spurgeon was one, probably and still is one of the most famous uh, pastors ever. And he, he lived uh, 1834 to 1892 in London. And uh, at that time, there wasn't any microphones. And yet his church was 6,000 members. 6,000 members. And if you, you can pick up any, and w one thing that w was unusual, he wrote his sermons completely out. And you can go to the library and you can, you, can check out, you can check out books and you can see his full sermons. And even though he lived uh, so long ago, uh, well over 160, you know, he was born well over 160 years ago, his sermons are so relevant for today, so, de so deep. And in fact, he, he did not even go to college. He did not even go to college, and yet he was such a powerful orator. Well, he, he wrote a commentary on Psalm 84, 7. And, uh, he, and specifically the phrase, they go from strength to, to strength. And I think it's on the screen. And he wrote in a book, Morning and Evening. This is a de devotional guide. Uh, the Tom slide. Yeah. Putai. Okay. And... Uh, and it, he wrote this about this phrase, they go from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength. Fretful spirits sit down and trouble themselves about the future. Alas, they say, we go from affliction to affliction. You know, optimist, pessimist, optimist. Oh, the future's going to be good. I can do this. All right, pessimist. Oh, boy, things are so terrible. Oh, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be horrible. You okay. can't. Well, fretful spirits sit down and trouble themselves. Alas, they say, we go from affliction to affliction, hardship to hardship. Very true, O thou of little faith. But then thou goest from strength to strength also. Thou shalt never find a bundle of affliction which has not been bound up in the midst of its sufficient grace. God will give you the strength of ripe manhood with the burden allotted to full-grown shoulders. In other words, very simply, he's saying, yes, you will find hardship in life. You will meet with difficulty. You will meet with problems. However, in the midst of that problem, you also find God's grace. God's grace, his autumn grace, his sufficient grace. It's bound there. You see, you see these flowers put together. Somebody made this arrangement. Well, in the midst of the flowers, in the midst of hardship, of that was hardship, God's sufficient grace is so. There's God's grace. And he's saying we need to remember this. And, and so we have to have the faith. We go from strength to strength. Yes, humanly, you, you scientists tell me, tell me about energy. Energy has a source and then it dissipates, correct? Well, here it's saying our energy, where humanly we are very weak, but wait, God has a sufficient power source there, His grace, His grace. What impossible situation might you be facing tonight? What impossible situation might you be facing tonight in your life? Is there something, some situation right now that you're struggling with? 
And as you look at it with human eyes, all you can, all you can see is that it, you just come to the conclusion it's never going to change. It's never going to get better. We've talked about suicide before. You know, suicide is the ultimate decision. What, what is it saying? What statement does that action make? Well, it makes is, this problem is so big, it's even bigger than, than God. God cannot help me with this problem. I can't handle it anymore. I'm gone. It's the ultimate expression of giving up. Maybe you feel like giving up. Maybe you feel like quitting, giving up and quitting, because waiting for God is just too hard. Or putting the faith in God is just too hard. When I went, the first time I went to Russia in 1995, a uh, very wonderful experience. I flew to Moscow, a day and a night in Moscow, 13 hour uh, train trip to Voronezh. Eight-hour bus ride to a little village called Pesky, and um, and at that time in 1995, the Russian economy was horrible, absolutely horrible. But the Russian people were so proud, and so uh, I don't know strong. And and I went there, and we we ministered to people, and one lady in particular unwed, three children, and uh, reaching out to her and speaking to her. And she very honestly and very plainly said, faith in God for me is, is difficult, impossible. They taught us in school not to believe in God. And I, and I said, well, okay, you know, well, I know, I know what's true. And, you know, we, she was in the midst of a difficult circumstance and we and I said, I want to pray for you. And there on the on the little street with a path that leads through the grass going to her house, we stopped right there. And it was in the evening as the sun went down. And we stopped right there on the street, just me, she and I, and we prayed. And after we prayed, she very honestly said, I think that's just words. I think it's just words. I think it's just noise. And I said, well, I know who I'm praying to. And it's not just words. And as the week progressed, uh, I preached nine times that, that, time, that particular that week. And we saw wonderful people respond to the message. We had 101 decisions. And the 101st decision was that lady, Galena. And she had, went from, she had went from the point of, well, I don't believe. I don't believe in prayer. I don't believe in God to the point of, Jesus, I need you in my life. Come into my life. Forgive me my sins. I trust you. I believe in you. And particularly the Baptist church in Russia has had terrible persecution. Specifically, the church where we, I was was over 100 years old. And the, the three brothers that started that church, each one had been put in prison, some of them for, for well over 25 years. And the Baptists had been persecuted. And, and that was, it's not, even as we went from place to place after we left, the government officials would come. What were those Americans talking about? What were they doing? What were they here? And this lady was said, this was the environment that this lady lived in. And yet, she came to that point where she put her faith and her trust in, in God. Waiting, she, she, she was able to do that. For us, we feel like giving up. It's an impossible situation. And you know, the, the thing about us as Christians, too, is we feel guilty. I'm supposed to be this great. I'm Kyoe Chipsa, right? I'm a deacon at church or I'm a pastor, or I'm Bumoksa, or I'm Chandasa, I'm a leader at church, and I'm supposed to set the example for everybody, but I have doubts, and it's not easy. Well, folks, let me encourage you, and let me ask you this evening to share those thoughts, those feelings with God. Share those thoughts with Him. He knows them anyway. But we have to confess them to ourselves and confess, the, confess them to God as well. 
Ask God to give you the strength to endure. Okay? Ask God to give you the strength to endure. Oftentimes, trials are not just, you know, one-time event. No, it, it goes on, this circumstance, that impossible circumstance. Tell God how he may use you in that situation for his glory. Acknowledge his sovereignty as almighty God, who can do far and above all beyond that we ask or think. That's Ephesians, Ebe Sosomalsen. And if you follow the examples that we've looked at tonight, Elisha, the little boy with Elisha, the disciple, Samson, and then Sarah and Mary, if you follow those examples, you'll see that, that God will help you, that your burden, your emotional burden will be lighter, and that your strength will be renewed. So I'm going to ask you now, just as we close, as we uh, close the message, I ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And I just want to speak to you uh, just for a moment. Remember, my purpose here is to encourage you. Impossible situations. Is there anyone here tonight that is in the midst of an impossible situation? Many of you are here in Korea by yourselves. You're separated from your families by thousands of miles. Maybe there's a problem back home and you're not able, and you're frustrated, and you're not able to help. Maybe you're torn emotionally about that. I need to be back home to help, but I can't be. Maybe you're Maybe your research, maybe your research is, maybe your research isn't going as well as you're supposed to go, and you're under pressure to produce good results. What about your relationships at the institute, at work, at school, at home? The biggest stressors in our lives are relationships. Maybe you're feeling trapped in a difficult relationship. You don't know what the best way is to respond. How, you don't know how to respond to make things better. God wants to help you tonight. If you're in an impossible situation tonight, I want you to just raise your hand and I want to see it and I want to pray for you specifically. You're in a, are you in an impossible situation tonight and you want to say, uh, Pastor Hale, I want you to pray for me and I want to trust God to help me in this situation. Anyone? Right now, just lift your hand. Okay. Let's pray. And I want you, if you are in an impossible situation, I want you to agree with me in prayer tonight as I pray for you. Let's pray.